the William Lowell Putnam Mathematical Competition, often just called the Putnam Exam, is an infamously challenging math competition for undergrad college students from the United States and Canada. It consists of 12 problems broken up into two separate three hour long sessions. Each problem can earn you up to 10 points. So there's a total of 120 points to be earned in the competition. And the average score is usually between two and eight. So these problems are on average very difficult. Today, we'll be solving the first problem from the first session of the 59th Putnam competition, which was held in 1998. It's a geometry problem. It gives us a right circular cone and an inscribed cube. We've got a little bit of information and we've got to use that information to solve for the side length of the cube. Oh, and the coffee's ready right now. Coffee time math with Wrath of Math? <gasps> <laughs> There is nothing I'd rather be doing right now than solving this problem with you. Uh, let's do it. So what have we got going on here? Well, we've got a right circular cone. Looks kind of like this. Recall that a right circular cone is created when we take a right triangle, which you can kind of imagine right there, and revolve it about one of its legs. That, of course, produces a circular base, and we're given that the radius of our circular base is one. We also have that the height of our right circular cone is three. That's the distance from the base to the top of the cone called the vertex. So that distance from here down to here, that's the height and it is three. For a right circular cone, the segment going from the vertex down to the center of the base is perpendicular to the base and thus the length of that segment is the height of the right circular cone. You might call that segment going from the vertex to the center of the base the axis of the cone or you might call the line containing it the axis of the cone. Then we have a cube inscribed in the right circular cone. So our cube looks something like this. These four points are all touching the cone on this top face of the cube. And we're given that the bottom face of the cube is contained entirely within the circular base of the cone. So the base of the cone and this bottom face of the cube lie in the same plane. We want to know what is the side length of the cube. Of course, the faces of a cube are all squares with equal side lengths. Say we call that side length S. How can we find S, the side length of the cube? Well, to find S, it would seem useful if we could distill all of our focus into a 2D slice, a 2D cross section of this cone and cube, because we're very comfortable with working in two dimensions. We would want the cross section of the cone and cube that we take to contain all of the important pieces and information to us. So we'd want it to contain a radius of the circular base or maybe a whole diameter. We'd want it to contain one of these side lengths of the cube and we want it to contain the axis of the cone going from the vertex to the center of the base because the length of that segment is the height which we also know. So consider the plane that contains these two opposite points of the cube as well as the center of the circular base of the cone. That plane slices right through the middle of the cone and the cube. It takes this sort of slice across the cube. And if we consider that cross section, that slice of the cone and cube, it's going to look like this. We have this triangle here. Here is the center of the circular base. And we've got this cross section of our cube. Let's label this diagram a little bit so we have a better idea of what we're looking at. Again, this point right here, this is the center of the circular base. We sliced right across there. So then the distance from that point over here to the point of the triangle, that point on the triangle, that is a radius of the circular base. And so that has a length of one. 
All right, what else do we know? Well, we also know this distance from the vertex down to the center of the base. That is the height of our cone. So we know the length of that segment there is three. We also know a side length of this red rectangle right here. That is this edge, this side of the cube. So that has a length of S and that's what we're trying to solve for. Now be careful. This is not a square, even though it kind of looks like it. It's this cross section of the cube, which is just a rectangle. This top side of the rectangle is this diagonal of the top face of the cube because we sliced right across there. So this is that diagonal. What is its length? Well, it's not S, but we could solve for it. Since this is a cube, all of its faces are squares. They all have equal lengths. So we know that this length here, this side length is S and this side length here is S. Additionally, since this face is a square, this here is a right angle, which means we can find the diagonal, which maybe we call D by using the Pythagorean theorem, of course, right? So the sum of the squares of the legs, S squared plus S squared is equal to the square of the hypotenuse of this right triangle. That's D squared. Then S squared plus S squared is 2S squared. Then if we take the square root of both sides, we have that the diagonal D is equal to the square root of 2S squared. Then we can take the S squared out of the square root to have that D is equal to S root two. That's just taking the S squared out of the square root because it's a perfect square, which leaves us with the diagonal D being equal to S square root of two. So we could label that here on our diagram. This distance, this side of our rectangle is S square root of two. Beautiful. All right, so this seems like a decent amount of information to work with. Now we've just got to set up an equation so that we can solve for S. But how are we going to do that? Well, notice we've got several triangles kicking around here. We've got this big triangle. We've got these two triangles. We've got some smaller triangles. So one way to establish some equalities when we have multiple triangles is to find some triangle similarity, identify similar triangles. Do we have any similar triangles here? Well, one that kind of jumps out to me is this little right triangle. It looks, it is a right triangle. We'll establish that in a minute. It looks like if we just scaled it up, it would be this bigger triangle here. So those look like maybe they're similar. Can we establish it for sure though? Let's see. We know that this bigger triangle is a right triangle. We know that because this here is a right triangle angle because this is a right circular cone. So this axis going from the vertex down to the base of the cone intersects the base at a right angle. Again, that's because this is a right circular cone. So we know this is a right triangle. Additionally, we know this smaller triangle is a right triangle because that's a right angle, because this cross section of the cube is a rectangle, which means this here is a right angle. So this also has to be a right angle. Okay, so they're both right triangles, this little one and this big one. So they have one pair of congruent angles. Do they have a second pair? They sure do. Real easy. This angle right here, this little one there. This is an angle of the little right triangle and it's an angle of the big right triangle. So it is of course congruent to itself. So this little right triangle and this big right triangle have two pairs of congruent angles. Thus by the angle angle similarity postulate, the two triangles have to be similar. Since they have two pairs of congruent angles, their third angles must also be congruent because they must add to 180. So this triangle is similar to this one, which means that corresponding sides of these two similar triangles are proportional. So we can start to write some equalities of ratios. Consider the ratio of this leg of our right triangle. That leg, of course, has a length of S. Consider the ratio of that 
to that, this leg, to this leg of the bigger right triangle. That leg, of course, has a length of three. That is the height of this big triangle, which is the height of our cone. Now, this is equal to the ratio of other corresponding sides of the similar triangle. So consider this leg length of the little right triangle. We don't know what that is, but it corresponds to this big leg length of the bigger similar right triangle. We know that this leg length of the bigger right triangle is of course one. That's the radius of our circular base. So remember we put the big right triangle three in the denominator of our first ratio. So we need to put its leg in the denominator of the second ratio as well. So what remains right now is to find the numerator the leg length of this little right triangle, the other leg length that we don't know. Certainly, this little leg length is equal to one, this whole distance, minus this little red piece that it doesn't contain. And it kind of looks like that little red piece might be half of this whole red piece. This might be half of s square root of two. How can we be sure that it is? Well, it is, and one way you could show that is by showing that this triangle here is congruent to this triangle here, which you could do by using the basic proportionality theorem. Then that would mean that this segment is congruent to this segment. However, this is a rectangle, meaning that this is congruent to this. Similarly, this is a rectangle, meaning that this is congruent to this, and so this red piece is congruent to this red piece. They're both half of that whole s root two. So indeed, this little leg length of our right triangle is one, the whole, minus the red piece it doesn't contain, which is half s root two. So that is our numerator, one minus half s root two, which we'll just write as s root two over two. Now, all we've got to do is solve this equation for s. All right, let's finish things up and solve for our side length. We can begin by multiplying both sides of this equation by three, leaving us with s is equal to three times one is three, minus three times s root two over two, which is three halves root two s. All right, now let's add three halves root two s to both sides so that we can get all the s terms on the left side of the equation. If we do that, right now we have one s, then we'll add three halves root two s. So on the left side, that's gonna give us one plus three halves root two s. Basically just adding this term to the other side and then factoring an s out of the two terms. And this is equal to three. That's what we have left on the right side of the equation. And I'll just put a comma here as we continue. Now we can divide both sides of this equation by one plus three halves root two. That's gonna give us that s is equal to, we have one plus three halves root two in the denominator, because that's what we divided by, one plus three halves root two, and we've got three in the numerator. All right, that's fine and dandy, but we probably want to rationalize the denominator. So how can we do that? How can we get rid of the radical here? Well, if we multiplied by square root of two over square root of two, that would get rid of this radical, but then we would have a square root of two over here getting multiplied by the one. So that's not quite gonna work. Instead, the weird form of one we have to multiply by uses what's sometimes called the radical conjugate. So what we wanna do is multiply by this term in the denominator, but flip the sign of the radical term. So we'll multiply by one minus three halves root two. And remember, we're not changing the fraction. We are, we're not changing its value. So we have to multiply by one minus three halves root two over one minus three halves root two. It's just a funny way of multiplying by one in order to change the appearance of our fraction. So continuing the equality down here, what's this gonna give us? Well, we can write out the denominator first just to see how long it's gonna need to be. We'll have one times one, which is just one. Then we'll have one times negative three halves root two. So that's minus three halves root two. 
Then we'll have 3 halves root 2 times 1, so that's plus 3 halves root 2, and you'll see how wonderfully this works out. Then we have 3 halves root 2 times negative 3 halves root 2, that's negative 9 fourths root 2 squared. So minus 9 fourths root 2 squared, but the square of the square root of 2 is just 2. So that's minus 9 fourths times 2. And that is the beautiful denominator of our fraction once we multiply by this weird form of 1 in order to get rid of the radical. In the numerator, we have 3 times 1, which is just 3, minus 3 times 3 halves root 2. So that's minus 9 halves root 2. Now in the denominator, notice we have just what we want. We're getting rid of the radical. Minus 3 halves root 2 plus 3 halves root 2. Those come together to be 0. So what are we left with? Well, in the numerator, we've got 3 minus 9 halves root 2. How many halves are in 3? Well, that would be 6 of them. So this is 6 halves minus 9 root 2 halves. So we can write that as 6 minus 9 root 2 over 2. It's 6 minus 9 root 2 over 2. That is our numerator. And then in the denominator, we have 1 minus 9 times 2 over 4. 9 times 2 over 4 is 18 over 4. So this is 1 minus 18 over 4. 1, of course, is equal to 4 fourths. So we can bring these two uh, terms in the denominator into just one fraction. Rewriting this as 6 minus 9 root 2 over 2. That's the numerator. It's staying the same. And then in the denominator, we have 4 fourths minus 18 fourths. That's negative 14 fourths. All right, we're almost there. We're dividing by a fraction. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So let's do that. Continuing this string of equalities, we've got our numerator 6 minus 9 root 2 over 2. We're dividing it by a fraction. That's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of the fraction, which is negative 4 over 14. Just flipping the numerator and denominator, and we can put the negative wherever we want. All right, so what's this going to give us? Well, we've got 6 times negative 4, which is minus 24. And then we've got minus 9 root 2 times negative 4, which is positive 36 root 2. So that's 36. I'm going to have to rewrite that. 36 root 2. And then we had the minus 24. Minus 24. So that is our numerator. Then in the denominator, we've got 2 times 14. That's not so bad. That's just 28. All right. What's some final simplification we can do? Well, every term here has a factor of 4. So we can multiply the numerator by 1 fourth and the denominator by 1 fourth. Of course, that's just a strange form of 1 in order to reduce the terms in our fraction. If we multiply the numerator by 1 fourth, what do we get? 36 root 2 times 1 fourth is just going to be 9 root 2. So that's 9 root 2 minus 1 fourth of 24 is 6. And then in the denominator, 1 fourth of 28, that's 7. And so we have that s is equal to 9 square root of 2 minus 6 over 7. So if we have a right circular cone with a base radius of 1 and a height of 3, and we've got an inscribed cube whose bottom face lies entirely within the circular base of the right circular cone, then the side length of that cube has to be 9 square root of 2 minus 6 over 7. And that's it. The end. Subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. <laughs>